It's the trope we all know and love, and boy is it present in almost any show or movie nowadays. Not that that's a bad thing. It just makes me wonder why do we love this trope so much, and how is this trope best done? To answer the first question, it could be anybody's guess. My assumption is that because no human is perfect, seeing characters who have faced negative circumstances, done horrible things, be objectively bad, and then learn to right the error of their ways, hopefully with genuine effort and time, gives us hope. The second question, how is this trope best done, probably has more than one answer. As a disclaimer, I'm going to be talking about redemption arcs that I've watched, meaning post-2000. So when I say let's talk about the most iconic redemption arc, I'm of course talking about Prince Zuko. I think the best quality of Zuko's redemption is the focus on his internal struggle. It's revealed early on that the reason Zuko was banished was because he spoke out of turn at a war meeting, defending lives that Ozai found disposable. This tells us right away that while Zuko is Aang's antagonist, he isn't the true evil in the show. This was a refreshing take from the binary of good versus evil that many shows from my youth instilled in my beliefs. Not only that, but I think for a lot of people, we saw ourselves in Zuko, and I don't just mean on a personal level. When Zuko finally makes the switch to join Aang in Season 3, he gives an amazing speech about how he grew up believing the Fire Nation to be a great kingdom sharing its prosperity. We even see how this propaganda took place on a civilian level. So it definitely helped me as a child realize the parallels between the Fire Nation and the United States. And if Zuko can turn against the evils he once stood for, so could I. Growing up, we were taught that the Fire Nation was the greatest civilization in history. And somehow, the war was our way of sharing our greatness with the rest of the world. What an amazing lie that was. Of course, the time the writers took with Zuko's redemption was also admirable. Zuko isn't just some cocky, chaotic, evil jerk. He's angry at the world, his father, and himself. However, even as objectively bad as he is, Zuko demonstrates humanity, not only in the flashbacks, but in season two. You see Zuko slowly open up to the idea of abandoning the hunt for the Avatar. You see that Zuko's redemption is clearly tied to Iroh's influence, hence Iroh's presence in nearly every defining moment of Zuko's subtle improvement in morals. What I really love about Zuko's redemption, above all else, is his setback in Crossroads of Destiny, the season two finale. Zuko is finally making peace with not capturing Aang and restoring his honor, but then Azula dangles the promise of returning home in front of him. Zuko makes a bad call. A really bad call. He betrays Iroh and returns to the Fire Nation. This is when you really notice just how integral Iroh is to Zuko's redemption. Zuko becomes lost, feeling empty when he should feel whole. He has everything, but he still sneaks off to see Iroh, seeking advice. The scene where Zuko is framed as being the one caught in darkness and Iroh is in the light is one of the most gorgeous metaphors of the show. It also demonstrates that Iroh has done what he can, and that Zuko now must be the one to pull himself from darkness and redeem himself. And he does, telling off his father and seeking his uncle's forgiveness. What I really, really appreciate is that not everyone immediately forgives Zuko. It teaches the viewers that while redemption is a worthy pursuit, no one owes you forgiveness, and if they give it to you, you'll have to be patient. It makes sense that Toph is the first to forgive Zuko, as she had little interaction with him, and oddly enough parallels Iroh at times. Then Sokka and Aang, who are laid back and a pacifist respectively. And it makes sense that Katara, who has always had a valid hatred for the Fire Nation, takes the longest to come around. And in the Southern Raiders episode, Katara makes it clear that forgiveness isn't the default. She does not forgive the man who murdered her mother, however she chooses to forgive Zuko. That makes his redemption feel all the more earned, instead of just expected. TLDR, the most important part to a well-written redemption, is that the character fights for it. Catra, out of all of the redemption arcs I've witnessed, is probably the most debatable in terms of, like, everything. If I'm being honest, I hated Catra until season 5. However, I'm always self-aware that I change my mind very quickly after any form of redemption happens, and I knew hers was inevitable. Shira is one of those shows where we pretend that no one dies. They just walk away from the battle heavily bruised. However, if we're being honest with ourselves, Catra is responsible for murder and death. All that good stuff. In fact, she's almost directly responsible for Angela's death. However, we have different scales for what's considered irredeemable in fiction versus real life. So all Catra had to do was say, sorry my dudes, sacrifice herself, and then get a rad redemption haircut. After sitting on the final season for a while, I still love Catra's redemption, but I feel like some of her individual apologies could have been fleshed out more. I know there was a lot going on with the plot, but similar to how Zuko had individual episodes with the members of Team Avatar in the final season, I'd have liked to see Catra have individual episodes with some characters, Scorpia and Mermista, mostly. Then again, with the time they had, I know this is just a selfish fantasy. 
What I love in regards to Shira and redemption arcs, however, is the inclusion of Shadow Weaver's End. I will say I'm uncomfortable with people throwing the word redemption around with this one. To me, Shadow Weaver is the example that not all shots at atonement will end in redemption. She's not forgiven, nor has her final sacrifice made her a hero. She is someone who has, in the end, recognized that she is no saint and used her life to do something good for once. However, Shadow Weaver is the same awful, abusive, selfish person as before. She is what Catra could have become had she not taken the steps to bring her atonement to redemption. This reminds me of Terra in a vague way. Terra was a lot worse than you may remember, believing at one point that she had killed the very people who first believed in her. To be honest, her atonement doesn't even hit the same way as Shadow Weaver's, because while Shadow Weaver is an objectively worse person, Terra only sacrificed herself because she was going to die either way. May as well die a hero than a villain. Okay, let's talk background redemption, usually reserved for longer shows or series for characters whose redemption is subtle and overarching. I'd accept the argument that Zuko falls into this category, but his redemption is such a core part of his character in the show that it feels weird to consider it background. Weiss Shni, however, is a great example. You know what I said earlier about Avatar being my introduction to how good and evil isn't a binary and children need to learn this? Well, Ruby, despite its many, many faults in terms of laying out morals, does one thing right, demonstrating that not every single person exists in some gray area. And yes, there are objectively awful people. They are dirty capitalists who abuse their children, deny rights to anyone but the 1%, and use slave labor to grow their empire. Yep, real world shit right here. No moral gray. Weiss is actually extraordinary like Zuko this way. She starts off knowing her father is no saint, but she's most certainly a bad person. Like Zuko, Weiss sees the evil in her father on a personal level, not on a larger scale. Like Zuko, Weiss ends up growing as a person after outside influences teach her that the world is not what she grew up believing, and that even if she didn't know any better, it doesn't take away from the harm she's done. What does she say? Since you took control, our business has operated in a moral gray area. If the show kept up with this, Weiss would suck. However, Weiss subtly changes with every season. She goes from being a brat who doesn't get along with her teammates to working well with them. She goes from this to being the first one to actively seek the others out, breaking away from her family once and for all to find her friends. I love that she's the one to hug Yang first, and then in season 7, Winter. Weiss has thawed her frozen exterior and ends up being the one providing warmth in the end. That talk she has with Yang in season 5 is genuinely so heartbreaking, and if you told me while I was watching season 1 that this speech about being there for Blake when she returns no matter what the circumstances came from Weiss, I wouldn't believe you. The thing is, I can't tell much a difference between each season in terms of how Weiss acts, but if you put season 1 Weiss next to season 7 Weiss, it's such a stark contrast. That's how you know her redemption was well earned. Like Zuko, she applies her redemption to the system at large. Like Katra, her personality is still very much like Weiss, making her redemption not feel like it completely changed her core character either. One show whose core concept is redemption is Infinity Train. Essentially, people who need therapy board a magical train that could potentially kill them. In season one, Tulip doesn't require redemption as much as self-realization. Season two, Jesse needs to redeem himself for letting his passive nature get his brother hurt. And in season three, Grace comes to realize that she has raised an army of tiny, selfish little monsters and murderers, and that while she has not strayed too far from redemption, the same can't be said for everyone. I think this finale was a great example of how forgiveness isn't always a package deal with redemption or atonement. And Grace is definitely a character I can't help but feel for. She was only a kid when she boarded the train, and she's actively trying to fix her mistakes. It makes you think about how people often have reasons for the shit they do. Once again, reasons aren't excuses. And redemption is a trope better written for when characters have to learn their actions were cruel in the first place. Let's set up another show completely about redemption. Perhaps a bit on the nose. While The Good Place isn't animated, it would be a sin to talk about redemption and not include it. In The Good Place, the characters all have different faults. Eleanor, Tahani, and Jason's reasons for being in The Bad Place are rather direct. But Chidi is where the show delves deeper into the concept of redemption. Like Jesse in Infinity Train, Chidi's fault is more just a bad habit that ends up negatively impacting others. Indecisiveness is hardly a call for eternal damnation. The show later reveals that the reason these characters are in the bad place isn't even because of their personal faults, but because humanity as a whole will burn because there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. Essentially, Chidi was right. It was the almond milk. 
The characters not only had to improve on a personal level, but fight for humanity and demonstrate that people are capable of change if surrounded by support and the means to educate themselves. They even push this notion by having the demon himself turn to the side of good once he sees the hope and belief that the humans have. Cheesy, right? But it is the most relevant form of redemption to any viewer. The good place implies that redemption usually ends up altruistic, even if it doesn't start off that way. Also, redemption arcs don't have to be just a character shifting from a big bad villain to a shining hero. Redemption arcs can vary. Sokka and John share a similar experience. They start off with a messier moral compass and misplaced intentions, Sokka even demonstrating misogyny. They both end up as such strong, developed characters, both the underpowered ones who find their strength in battle through unconventional means, as well as possessing a penchant for leadership and strategy. They were never evil, but there were still elements of redemption. Even Amity from the Owl House isn't necessarily a villain. Don't get me wrong, she's a bully, but that's going to have a different remedy than a full-on villain. Although let me say that while I love Amity and the way her character shifts, it was an underdeveloped redemption. While it's cute that she started improving as a person because of Luce, I feel like there was an apology in order for Willow. Kind of like how I wished there was more dialogue between Scorpia and Catra before the redemption was considered complete. Lilith will have a better redemption if they play it up in season 2, because her story seems to focus more on her past than Amity and her atonement. Alright, transition words, next topic, Dragon Prince. Soren is another example of a character who believed their path was the just one, only to later realize that they were on the wrong side. Seeing as Soren's whole thing was working hard to appease his father, the second the seed of doubt was planted into his head and he drifted from his father, unlike Claudia, I knew that Soren was a man who was loyal to true good, not just family ties. Somehow I was still surprised when he stabbed what he believed to be Viren. I was surprised because while I knew Soren redeemed himself, I didn't know he'd put his newfound beliefs above family ties that soon. This is the good part about using siblings or partners or whatever to demonstrate different paths. While Soren and Claudia and Zuko and Azula are very different in terms of characterization, the two sets of siblings demonstrate that their loyalties define their choices, even if it makes some of them morally conflicted. I think Claudia knows that her father is wrong, but her trust in family is greater than Soren's. This is why Soren is willing to forfeit his family ties in order to gain his redemption. Characters like Mitch from Glitch Tex and Jamak from Kipo are characters who seem to hate the fact they're redeeming themselves, which is adorable, but they can't help to do the right thing. I'd argue that this makes the redemption feel more fulfilling in some senses, because you know it's for altruistic purposes. Shrek did it first, right? Characters who hate with every ounce the fact that they're softening up, it just hits a certain way. Then there's the opposite, characters who genuinely struggle to improve. Gara from Naruto was a straight murderer, but he found the power of friendship, and since we have different scales for redemption and animation, we are A-OK -okay with the bloody murder a bit. All in all, I think a good redemption should take its time, demonstrate that even while the character is redeemed, they have to fight to maintain it. Having more than one redemption line for different characters in the show helps, as well as making their redemptions have some ups and downs. It's more realistic that way. I like when there are gray morals or a character who realizes their gray morals aren't so gray after all. I also like when a character seems surprised by their own redemption as you get a sense of pride that they feel they were strong enough to change. Almost any show or movie has a redemption arc or two anymore, and I think it's a great testament to how much we humans crave improvement. Somehow, we don't get sick of watching people improve because we don't get tired of improving ourselves or at least striving to do so. Also, these are some fresh spoilers, but I just finished watching the new season of Kipo, and some redemptions, some redemptions really hurt, don't they? They really, really hurt. 